Watch out, here I come. Hum, hum, hum. Welcome to the lunch hour with Mr. Credit. Ooh, hot. Oh, yeah, that's hot. That is hot. And today, it's Turnaround Tuesday. Let the games begin. Hi-yo. And today, we're teaching you how to point your financial life in the right direction. Gee, I sure hope there's a happy ending. I love a happy ending. And now, the lunch hour with Mr. Credit on ESPN Radio 1700. Welcome to your lunch hour. It is the Mr. Credit Lunch Hour, ESPN 1700, where we guarantee to make you smarter than everyone else. I am Dan Osgood, sitting in the hot seat today, once again, on Turnaround Tuesday. Today I have a very full panel today, and this is going to be a great show. Lots and lots of outstanding information. Sitting directly across from me, if you are tuning in on MrCredit.tv, watching the live stream, you can see all of us sitting in here, the packed house. Uh, sitting directly across from me, we have Corey Fish, who is the Human Resources Director at the Union Tribune. Corey, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Great you could join us. Thanks. Uh, directly to his left and my right, we have a, a pretty regular visitor of the show. Uh, filling in for Jared Kaza today, we have his boss, Jim McFall, from Neil Diamond downtown. Jim, welcome back. It's good to be here again. Glad you can make it. And another very special guest. We've spoken with Nate in the past, but we have Nate Robinson with... Movie Night for Hunger, we are going to promote a great, great cause, who is a local real real estate agent and also an author of The Warren Buffett Approach to Sell Real Estate, which is a fantastic book. Um, Nate, welcome. Glad you could make it. Thank you. I appreciate you guys uh, having me out today. Yeah, Great. We, we've spoken with Nate in the past, and we look forward to hearing more about his his cause here, Movie Night for Hunger. Well, a quick look at the markets. Uh, if, if, if anyone pays attention, even though we preach to you to ignore the news as much as possible. It, it's kind of hard to, to not pay attention when everyone's saying the sky is falling, a correction is imminent, it's happening. Uh, the markets are off today. Overall, still not hugely significant. We're only looking at 1%. Um, they have run up so much. A small correction is a healthy market, so this this could be a correction, but it could also just be an event caused by everyone saying a correction is going to happen. That'll make it drop a little bit, and then you'll see it rally right back to where it was or go higher. Um, stocks and bonds both off today. So I, I would say just stick to your plan. Don't panic. Don't let the news uh, get you down and cause you to have a knee-jerk reaction and do something that could be negative to your plan. Um, and speaking of the markets, we have an interesting story. Uh, Warren Buffett, I think most people have heard of him. He's been mildly successful, I guess you could you could say. <laughs> um, Berkshire Hathaway, his company, reported its biggest quarterly earnings haul ever this week. Or it was on Friday after the bell. Um, profits of Berkshire Hathaway up 41% for the quarter. That's $6.4 billion dollars. Not a bad profit. You, you, you guys do that at Neil Diamond, right? The, not on a quarterly basis. <laughs> <laughs> um, pretty interesting. And there, there were a few takeaways. There's a, a good analysis of all the report f- on Yahoo Finance. Um, Warren Buffett, you, you can't argue that he's probably the greatest single investor in the history of the markets at this point, if you look at his career. Um, he, he does things in a manner that probably don't, aren't mo- the most appropriate for your everyday investor. One of the big parts is his investments are surprisingly very focused. And you can get big gains because of that, but you can also take big hits. I trust his judgment. He's got a great track record. But basically, four holdings account for about 60% of his investments. Th- those investments are Wells Fargo, Coca-Cola, American Express, and IBM. So very concentrated to the tune of 60%, but it's obviously working. Here is someone who looks into companies and only invests in companies that he understands and that he feels the rest of the world can understand easily. That's why he really has never invested in a tech company, although he does own heavy shares in IBM these days. Um, And that is his only tech holding. And on a relative basis, that's his biggest loser. It's only up 10%. <laughs> Most people would love that, but um, everything else has gone significantly higher. 
Uh, one interesting takeaway from the report, um, even though Mr. Buffett talks heavily on taxes and everyone should pay their fair share, he's no different than anyone else. Uh, one of his transactions, uh, he cashed out uh, when Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post. He was able to swap out of shares, and in, instead of cash, he was able to book a, ten, uh, a 100-fold gain on Graham stock, which he purchased back in the 70s without paying a penny of taxes. So although he always preaches everyone should pay their fair share and he's willing, he's, he's acting the same as every corporation, which when, he, when it's available to you, you should. That's how, how you get things to work in your favor. And, and he does a great job of, of leading, I guess. Um, on, a, on another switch here, it's summertime, kind of winding down. If, you, if you're looking to take a trip, I believe you may want to book that trip, or at least the flight, very soon. U.S. airfares are on the rise, according to the AP, um, and they're outpacing inflation. If you want to trust the government's release of what inflation is, uh, airfares have risen 2.7% for the first half of the year alone. Um, and they're expecting even higher increases as the economy continues to uh, improve. Uh, last, let's see, the ticket price that are, on average is about $509.15 per ticket on average. And that's up about $14 from the same period last year. So the first half of the year last year, you could have gotten a ticket for $14 cheaper. Um, and that, that is an increase of about 2.7% compared to the supposed 2.1% gain in the CPI, which is the benchmark for inflation. Although we talk here on the radio show quite often about the Big Mac index, which that is the cost of a Big Mac and how it moves from year to year and the fact that a Big Mac factors in every imaginable potential inflationary item, transportation, real estate, agriculture, you name it, it's tied to the price of a Big Mac. And a Big Mac has gone up about 5.2% per year since the end of the recession. So I probably look at that as a more accurate view of inflation. So with that being the case, airfare isn't rising at, at real inflation, but it is rising faster than the, the released information that doesn't factor in fuel and things like that um, overall. One of the main reasons is the airlines have finally figured out match the supply of seats to the the traveler's demand, and you can charge almost whatever you want. Uh, we, we talked about this prior to the show, Corey. You, well, it's easy to do when there's so limited amount of airlines now. And, right. and with consolidation, it just it is what it is. They control the market even more than they used to. And that that's one of the biggest factors. There's really only four main airlines anymore. And so they're not afraid that if they raise their rates that someone's going to undercut them. Where in years past, there was always the price wars you'd hear about, and everyone would run out and book some seats. It's just not easy to do that anymore because no one wants to undercut the other. Um, another one, the, the fares that, that are being quoted here, this $509, isn't the whole picture because you're still having to pay baggage check, 50 75 and even more depending on the airline. And now they're adding extras where you can pay more for a little le extra leg room, um, early boarding, fast track security lines, things like that. You can pay a little extra. So you could literally add between nine and three hundred dollars to the cost of your flight if you wanted to take advantage of all these other opportunities. So, five hundred is just a small glimpse into what it costs. So, if you believe that they're going to continue up and you're thinking about a trip, you may want to book them sooner rather than later, and save yourself a little bit of money. You know, I think they ought to get more specific with what they charge extra for. They should have like a "Can I charge extra for the don't sit me near the kids" section, <laughs> which would be tough for me. I have three kids, but um, I'd probably still pay to sit you, away from from the sit kids. Sit away from, from your own kids? Uh, sure, for a five-hour flight, absolutely. Or maybe the uh, "Can I not sit next to the guy who snores really loud?" And maybe they can start to price that in. I mean, I'd probably be willing to pay for that on a oh, long flight for sure. Your plug, your plugs, nose plug, whatever it takes. I shouldn't have mentioned yeah, it. Right? It's, coming, coming, it's coming. It's coming. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they are listening. Um, and that the, the the one thing that they added, one of the reasons for the baggage fee was the fuel surcharge, and the reality is the cost of fuel is a hair lighter this year. But of course, they're not reducing. Never. The charge. Never see that. Once they put it, because people are used to paying this, so that's not going to go away just because gas is going on. I think if gas went back down to $2 a gallon, 
they wouldn't take this away. It's it's easier to raise and leave it there than to ever reduce, and and that's how they tend to do business. But um, with Corey here, I saw a story that is of great interest here. Um, last week, they announced uh, the July employment numbers. And it looks like the economy gained 209,000 jobs, and the jobless rate increased by a tenth, but still not significant. It didn't jump up over 7% or anything. It went from 6.1 to 6.2, pretty insignificant overall. And depending on how you factor it, that number could probably be lower or even much higher if you, if you want to add in all the small details. Um, but Economists had estimated approximately 238,000 jobs would be created last month. The real numbers were 209, so not quite on estimates. However, it is the sixth straight month of 200,000-plus employment increases, which is the longest stretch, such stretch since 1997. So definitely it's showing signs of things moving upward and in the right direction. You can always argue, well, gee, there's a lot of people not being factored in like the people that have been on unemployment, the extended benefits for two years that have been falling off the rolls every month. Yes, they are part of the picture, but that that has always been part of the equation for as long as I can remember. Corey, you probably have more insight to that. Uh, yeah, and the equation always it changes every once in a while on how long those people are going to stay on or off, but it's been pretty consistent for a long time. And, and it, the number is what the number is, but there's always that secondary number of uh, right. uh, underemployed. Well, and they've been going back and revising numbers in across the board. Every time they revise, they've been going upward as more jobs have been created than they initially estimated and calculated. So that's a positive sign. More often than not, with numbers that get changed, it's in the wrong direction. Well, after the fact, so no one pays attention any longer. But this, in fact, they're they're increasing significantly, five or 10,000 jobs per month that they're revising back upward. So... We definitely look like we're heading in the right direction. Um, and one of the bigger takeaways that I saw from this, healthy payroll advances in manufacturing and construction for the middle income sectors have have really made a big, that, that's a big difference because that's where we've had the problem with as jobs have increased, the, the wages have stayed really flat or decreased over the last five, 10 years. Or th this is a pretty encouraging sign that we're seeing wages actually tick up a little bit. That could be a much bigger boost to the economy than even just the extra employment numbers coming out. Yeah, there, there certainly are segments that are doing uh, better than uh, better than others. I mean, unfortunately, overall, it's still, I believe, right. up only two percent in the past twelve months with wages right. uh, overall. Which, but that's still a positive but direction because if you look back ten years ago, we're about five five and a half percent lower than what wages were. Right. Every little bit of this information that's positive, we're right. going to take all the positive information yes. we can get. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and with that, um, with Corey's experience, we are going to speak with him next regarding with this market the, the job market getting better looking like it's a better picture have you been considering changing jobs and if so what's the best way to go about it uh, so stick around Corey is going to give us from the horse's mouth some of the best tips he can give you to properly leave a job and move on to another one and, and all the proper steps to take you are listening to Your Lunch Hour, ESPN 1700, Mr. Credit, where we guarantee to make you smarter than everyone else. If you would like free advice from Mr. Credit, just call or text 619-786-7853. That's 619-786-7853. Welcome back to the Lunch Hour with Mr. Credit. And today, it's Turnaround Tuesday on ESPN Radio 1700. All right, welcome back. It is your Lunch Hour, the Mr. Credit Radio Show, where we are guaranteeing to make you smarter than everyone else. And Corey, we have Corey Fish in, in studio, uh, Human Resources Director at the Union Tribune, uh, first-time guest. We are very Grateful to have you here. Um, now the job market's getting better. People may be looking for a new job. Once they find that job, what's the proper way to quit? Well, so let's start job? with you know where we ended off in the last segment. The job market is doing better, which is overall great news. Sure, there's some pluses, there's some minuses, but one of the big minuses that I see from here 
is the fact that when you talk about the unemployment rate ticking up, it's ticking up because more people are entering into the job market, right? So for the person, the casual person who's looking for their job, that's not necessarily good news. That means they have more competition coming against them. But that's pretty, that, that's kind of obvious, I think, to anyone who's looking at these numbers. Additionally, though, as the job market improves, what you now have is folks who have been in their current job and maybe they're not satisfied or they're looking for a better opportunity or for whatever reason, it's just time for them to be done. Now they're going to start looking and they're not showing up in any of these numbers either because they have jobs. Yeah, there's, there's been a lot of people I've talked to over the last four or five years that not happy with their job, but they say, at least I have one. Exactly. And so now those people, as the job market starts to improve, they're going to start looking for that job. And I'm not out here to say that people that are unemployed are less qualified, but it, it, the, the statistics show that folks who are interviewing or applying for jobs that have active employment have a better ch- a chance than people who are unemployed. So the job market, uh, it, it, while it's getting better, it's getting more crowded for the folks who are out there looking for the jobs, okay. which just puts all the more emphasis on you want to have a great resume, you want to be able to interview well and have those soft skills that employers are really looking for. But, you know, so the job market's doing better, and and you're one of those fortunate few that have gotten a job, and you've got to resign a job. So, I mean, the big question that we've posed today is, how do you do that, and how do you do that the proper way? Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm a big proponent of, you know, you always want to you always want to be on people's good side, right? You always want to leave them smiling. You always want to leave uh, them thinking, you know what, that dude was a good guy. Mm-hmm. And, and who doesn't know the story of someone burning a bridge on the way out and that really backfiring down the road? Well, it happens all the time. And, and what I find is that most of the time it happens over really inconsequential things. Um, you know, you, we have it all the time where people, it's just really inconsequential. They don't return like uh, their charger for their phone. Now, is that completely inconsequential and it costs the company $5, maybe $10 to replace? Absolutely. But it leaves me going, you know, come on. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't you leave on a good note? So we want to leave on a good note. And the, the starting way to do that, obviously, is to write a resignation letter. It seems very obvious, but it happens all the time where people go into their boss's office, hey, listen, I got another job and, and I'm out. And it's just, there's, there's no kind of documentation. It leaves, from an HR perspective, it leaves me going, well, well, what really did happen? Did the person come in and there was an argument with their boss? I just don't know. And for lack of a knowledge, you know, nature abhors a vacuum and my mind will start to wander. So, you know, leave a resignation notice. Always you you want to be doing that. You want to be really thankful. You want to be courteous. Hey, you guys have been so great to me and you've allowed me to have such opportunities. And I really want to thank you for that. Even if it's a little bit fake, you know what? You making the boss you're leaving feel like they've done a good is really going to go a long way. And it always goes back to that don't burn bridges. It's going to make them feel a lot better. All right. So you want to do that. You want to give notice, you want to give the two weeks notice. I mean, this is an at-will state, right? The attorney's mm-hmm. here saying, of course, at will. We can fire you for any reason, and you can quit for any reason. Realistically, to leave on that good note and to never burn a bridge, you should try to give two weeks notice. Right. Not just walk in and say, okay, I quit and walk out the door. Sure. And I think it also varies on the business you're in. Sometimes you want to give more. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I'm the managing shareholder at my law firm, and... We actually appreciate when we get a little more notice because you have people that are immersed in a case or something and you want to make sure the transition is smooth. And if you have someone who's working on a big project, you want to make sure that transition is smooth. Right. Well, if we can extrapolate not only the industry, but your position would also would also probably dictate that. You know, if you're a relatively, you know, low paid person low on the totem pole, you know, you might only need to give two weeks. If you happen to be, you know, one a lead counsel on a case, like you're saying, or if you're a vice president or a senior uh, director type person, you might want to give more notice. Now, what I hear a lot of times from applicants is, well, they don't want to give notice because they're just afraid that, uh, you know, they might get cut right away. The more notice they give, the more liable they are out there. But, you know, the bottom line is, is that let, let the, you want to go away doing the right thing. And, and if you give the notice, that, that's great news. Unfortunately, the employer can come in here and say, you know what, you're going to a competitor, and we'd like you out right now. And obviously, you, you, you should understand that if you're the person leaving the job. And quite honestly, if you're leaving to go to a competitor, you should be prepared for that. Mm-hmm. Most companies are not going to walk you out the door if there's no specific reason to do it. Um, alternatively, a lot of the applicants that I talk to say, uh, you know, I just don't know if uh, the company I'm coming to 
uh, will let me give two weeks notice. So I'd like to just give like three days notice. Well, that's that. I think that probably goes deeper into the company that you're going towards. Do you really want to go to a company that's not going to let you give two weeks notice? Yeah. Um, anyone who comes to me, hey, Corey, I, I, I'd love to accept this job. I got to give two weeks. I got to give three weeks or I'm working on a case. I need to give a month. Is that okay? Look, I'd much rather someone have the good common decency to say, I've really got to finish up what I'm doing here before I can commit to you full time. Because you know as the employer or as the boss, I'm going to get that courtesy whenever this person leaves as well. And I think we'd all want that. So why wouldn't we give it? Yeah. It's like they say, you know, you should uh, expect the best, but you got to be prepared for the worst. So, you know, exactly. And a lot of times, you know, you never know how the boss is going to take it because they could take it terribly, which kind of goes to the next point is not a hard and fast rule, but doing it on a Friday kind of gives everyone the weekend to chill out. Mm-hmm. Um, Cool, uh, cooling off period. Uh, cooling off <laughs> yeah, period, yeah, right? Yeah. You buy a car, you see that sign everywhere, no cooling off period. Mm-hmm. Well, normally w- what we'd like to have is, is a cooling off period because uh, in a lot of cases, the boss is just not happy. Uh, if you're a good productive employee, you're losing a great employee. This is not good for anybody. So, you know, you give them the week to cool off. They think about it. Uh, probably they communicate with their boss. Maybe they communicate that, um, hey, this is a guy or a girl we really need to keep. Let's do a counter offer. Right. Uh, counter offers, though, I, I, you know, I don't know what your as experience is with it, but uh, counter offers don't always work. But you should be prepared as that candidate or the, the person resigning. Be prepared for the counter offer. And, and, and what's your answer going to be? My experience with the counter offer is it usually bites me as uh, the employer, as the employer. Absolutely. Because most people aren't leaving just because of money. And if they are. It's usually short-sighted, right? and there's usually some other tension going on. They don't like who they're working with. They don't like the type of work they're doing, all sorts of variables. And Well, so and there's this great uh, uh, stat that I got uh, out of the Wall Street Journal, uh, National Employees Association, National Employment Ex- Association, uh, in their research shows that 80% of employees that uh, accept the counter offer resign within six months. Oh, and, wow. and, and to what you're saying, Jim, uh, the number one reason people leave companies is their supervisor. That's the bottom line, mm-hmm. which we should all learn as supervisors. That's the number one reason. Sure, money is up there, uh, but money is normally not the only reason why people leave. Mm-hmm. So uh, be ready for that counter offer. And, and it, some people, if they know the money, money is not the reason. Sure, it's always, it's always a reason. You know, whenever an athlete says it's not about the money, we always know it's probably about the money. Uh, it's always about the money a little bit. But if there's other reasons, be prepared for how am I going to answer that. So if the boss comes to you and says, hey, you know what, uh, uh, Dan, I, this is terrible. We'd like you to stay, and I'd like to give you a 20% increase. If you already know you're not accepting that, be ready for that. Hey, that's really right. generous, and I really appreciate how how uh, highly you think of me. But you know what, this other opportunity, you know, whatever you're going to say, something to leave it in a, a good taste in the mouth. You know, there's a a question that comes out always. And as the HR person, I always want to know. So where are you going? Mm -hmm. Where are you going? Have you ever been uh, dealt with this problem? I have some people that are very adamant about, I'm not going to tell you. Mm -hmm. Not telling you where I'm going. Like it's a big secret. Mm -hmm. Um, Depending on the industry, again, as we were discussing earlier, you might have to say, in that case, you're gone and you're gone right now. Um, I assume in a law firm, Jim, uh, if they don't tell you where they're going... Uh, you might have that situation. Are they going to be... Uh... I've never had it come up, to be honest. They always tell you, um, at least in my business, mm-hmm. they've always told us. But in my business is different from other people because if you go to another law firm, then we have to do things like make sure there aren't any conflicts. Right. Correct. And uh, in fact... It is frequently difficult to hire somebody on a lateral basis because you can lose business that you already have. You've created conflicts. So it, it's the same thing in the broker dealer world. You are prepared to walk out the door the moment you give that notice because the assumption is you're going to a competitor. They, the manager, will typically escort you to the door the moment you give them the notice because they don't want you taking any proprietary info and mainly just client data. And then they can unleash the wolves and try to 
cool. keep as many of your accounts. Right, as which, and of course, I shouldn't say this as an HR person, you've probably already done. Yeah. I was going to say, you did that two weeks ago. <laughs> but really, I mean, we do have people that will come out and say, I'm not telling you. And so especially in an environment, I mean, UT, we've got a large sales department. And a lot of that stuff is pretty specific. So if, if, if you're not gonna, if you're in the sales division and you're not uh, gonna tell me, I'm just gonna assume the worst. And yeah, you're right, I'm probably gonna escort you out that last day. Okay. But really, w- what not telling someone does, again, what we started with, it leaves a vacuum of, well, where are they going? Mm-hmm. Oh my God, are they going here? Are they going there? And now my mind, my imagination is gonna go to the worst possible things, okay. which is gonna leave us to the point where, what are we always coming back to? Don't burn bridges, right? Okay. Leave it on a good note. So just know ahead of time, if you're going to a competitor, just uh, they're going to find, I'm going to find out. I'm going to find out eventually. There's just, really no secrets in this day there's and age. There's no secrets in this day and age. People come to me all the time and say, well, how much do you know? Mm-hmm. Everything. Like, I know every. Just yeah. assume I know everything because I probably do. Yeah. Um, and folks who have told me I'm not go- and I'm not going to tell you, I find out within uh, a day because what does any socially connected person do? They update their LinkedIn and then Facebook. They, and their <laughs> Facebook, and uh, people still they LinkedIn uh, with their bosses and with their companies all the time, and within a day of them leaving, hey, congratulate Joe Schmo on their new job at whatever company. Right. So yeah. I know, mm-hmm. and so, now you've just so for fun. Do you congratulate them? <laughs> <laughs> it depends. Sometimes I sometimes I will if it's a good employee who um, has left on good terms. And, you know, they've come to me and said, hey, listen, this this competitor has offered me a great opportunity and, and I can't say no. Why not? I mean, uh, the, the, the days of, of people being at one company for their entire life are, are pretty much good and gone. So let's let's be happy when people move on to better opportunities. And you never know. I, I've hired I've rehired several people who have left for better opportunities and they come back and, and they're better employees when they come back a second time for higher positions. Yeah. Yeah. That is great, great information. Corey Fish, the Human Resources Director at the Union Tribune. Corey, is there a way if someone wanted to speak with you that they can get a hold of you? Or- uh, sure. I mean, you know, what we do, we do uh, job fairs all the time uh, on utsandego.com. They're digital <laughs> job fairs. And uh, lots of times there's resume reviews that go on with these job fairs. And um, the digital job fairs are really kind of the, the wave of the future on that. So um, check out the classified section on utsandego.com. Okay. And um, normally there are some sort of uh, job fairs out there, and, and resume reviews are part of that frequently. Great. That is, sounds awesome for our listeners. Once again, that is Corey Fish, the Human, Director, Human Resources Director at the Union Tribune in studio today. You are listening to Mr. Credit Lunch Hour, your lunch hour, where we are guaranteeing to make you smarter than everyone else. Stick around when we come back. Does it make sense to have a conversation with your spouse about whether or not to create a will? Well, it depends how well you get along with them. (laughs) (laughs) We'll we'll get to that when we come back. If you would like free advice from Mr. Credit, just call or text 619-786-7853. That's 619-786-7853. Welcome back to the Lunch Hour with Mr. Credit. And today, it's Turnaround Tuesday on ESPN Radio 1700. Welcome back. It is your Lunch Hour. I'm Dan Osgood in studio today filling in for Mr. Credit. And in our efforts to make you smarter than everyone else... We have a regular on the show in studio, Jim McFall with Neil Dimot downtown. Saw this in the, with regularity. I'll look at the ask the ask the editor or whatever the the columnist. And this was one was a pretty good one. I thought we could give some information out. And the question is, do you think it's unreasonable to ask my 76 year old husband to have a will drawn up? He had one made when we lived in Florida, but we moved to Georgia. He won't do it because he says wills aren't recognized in Georgia. Granted, we're in California, but this this is probably just state lines and virtually the same. Well, my my first advice would be go with a uh, <clears throat> some sort of living trust mm-hmm. because if you use a will, then it has to be probated, and that can take years. But a will is better than going in test state, right, which means nothing. you don't have a will. Um, and... Because with the will, you can still control a little bit of where all the assets go. You, you can go. T- control it all. It's just you can't control the timing of the disbursement. So you're probably looking at minimum of a year if it has to go through probate. Usually. 
and sometimes much longer. Right. Um, but you need to talk to your spouse. You need to talk to uh, the beneficiaries. A very common problem when people draw up wills is uh, people don't know where things are. Right. So, uh, and also, there are a lot of things that don't go into the will. For instance, if you have life insurance, life insurance is not uh, dispersed because of the will. It's under the terms of the policy. Right. And you see it same all the time. The IRA account and any qualified account, the same thing. Whatever, whoever's listed on the beneficiary form. Yeah, actually, presence. my wife just encountered that. She had a great aunt who passed away in the 90s. And she had a uh, investment account, and no one knew about it. So when everything was probated, it never went anywhere until the state of California finally sees it for lack of activity. And then there are companies that specialize in hunting the heirs down. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, then it's a real problem because even though the – uh, brokerage account had the information how things were to be devised, they don't have possession anymore. The state took it. Right. So now the state makes you go back and open a probate all of a sudden. Prove um, that you were the person that's entitled to that money? Yeah. Wow. It's, uh, it's kind of silly, but... Right. I, I've heard of a few cases where someone <laughs> looks on... Because there's websites you can search for lost money or whatever, whatever the site is. And you can look up your name, and if you see, hey, here's hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars, you, you file the claim, go through all the paperwork, then they send back and say, okay, now prove you are the person that's entitled to this money. Mm -hmm. And I know people that just give up at that point. Like, oh, I, I don't have time to go dig out the information they're going to require for this if it's just a couple hundred dollars. And they make it difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, they will say they don't, but the hoops that people have to jump through are ridiculous and you know, fortunately, my wife's married to someone who works in a firm that has a probate department. <laughs> so you know a good attorney? <laughs> yeah, his office is next to mine. So. <laughs> um, but it, it you should talk to people. And there was one thing in that article I was a little surprised. They said that a will executed in Florida wouldn't be valid in Georgia. Now, I don't know what Georgia law is, but that's not the norm. Most places, if you have a valid will that was executed yeah. in another state, but it was valid in that state, it will apply when you move. And that's actually under the Constitution because you have to give full faith and credit. To so this person asking this question could be a little bit misinformed on that? Yes. So, Okay, and then another law story here. I always like to bring some interesting lawsuits out. Um, looks like the court will not resurrect the, the atheist's request for the Ground Zero Cross lawsuit, which sounds good. It, this is just another in a long list of things that are kind of annoying to me. It's just like if, if you're listening to the radio and a song comes on you don't like, what do you do? You change the station. Correct. If you're driving by something that you don't agree with, do you just drive by and you stare at that item? We have here in town... Mount Soledad Cross. It's been there for years. They've been arguing about it. I drive by it regularly. Rarely do I look up and see it. And even if I did, it would not bother me. That means something to someone. If, if it doesn't mean the same thing to me, it doesn't mean I need to go fight that person and make them take it down because it's offensive to me. And I, I don't agree with that, that thinking because I think everyone who's trying to change something like that are imposing what they're being, they're claiming that they're being either discriminated against or, or being offended by, by forcing someone else to follow their rules. So it, it, it's a little bit frustrating, but Jim, what, what are your thoughts on this Ground well, Zero Cross? I'm not surprised with the court's ruling. Uh, the court said that it, um, it sounds counterintuitive because they said the cross is a, not a religious symbol. It's a, um, non-sectarian symbol of, for a memorial okay. and people say well it's a cross it's a symbol of christianity but it's sort of like you pick up your dollar bill it says in god we trust mm -hmm. they've said that is not a religious statement either anymore um prayers before meetings and things like that are acceptable so plus it's a practical matter. I can't imagine how New Yorkers would react if you took the cross down. Right. It would probably be violent. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. I would probably agree that that yeah. could cause outrage across the entire country, not just in New York. Yeah, yeah but in New York, it's going to be a really raw nerve. Yeah. And uh, I actually, I actually was at Ground Zero when it happened, and so uh, from New York, and uh, that definitely is something that would trigger a nerve and you know cause waves. So and not good waves. Not, no, not not, not no surfable. And and on the other part of that, the Second Circuit also rejected an attempt to include a separate plaque reminding viewers of the cross of those atheists who died in 9-11, which is that an, a, a new spin on this, or is it just continuing what, what was already decided in the past? I think the court's not going to tell you how you should set up your memorial okay. and to say that. Uh, once they say the cross is not a religious symbol in this instance, then to say you have to abide or make special concessions for a different group, uh, in the, this case atheists, is counterintuitive because the first one's not a religious symbol, according to the court. Right. So why should we do something for somebody else? Right, and the second one would be much more specific, so it could be interpreted as a... I don't know if an atheist would be considered a religious symbol, but the same basic concept. Yeah. So they would be creating something that they're saying doesn't exist on the first decision. And, and reading the article, it seems somewhat counterintuitive, but it is pretty consistent with, it's not an area I practice in, but it is consistent with the cases I've read over the years. Okay. Uh, I know there's still a lot of litigation going over the Mount Soledad Cross, but I think now a lot of that litigation stems from the land transfer and how it was done. Right. It's probably government IRS type issues of, well, that money was given away, so now there's got to be some tax effect here that we can jump on if we can't get the cross removed. Yeah, I, it's. Uh, I, I don't think the Mount Solida cross is going to last forever because people just don't want to keep spending the money. Right. They'll just give up after a while. Oh. All right. That is Jim McFall, uh, Jared Kaza's boss that we have in studio. Jared was off in court today. Yeah, he's actually in deposition. Okay. So um, if you want to reach out to Jim or Jared, 619-238-1712. They are downtown, Neil Diamond. Once again, that's 619-238-1712. You get a free consultation with Jared if you have any estate planning questions or needs. And I, I highly recommend you do that. Um, we have now saved the best for last. N- nothing against either of you two gentlemen, but this is a fantastic cause. We have Nate Robinson in studio today for Outdoor Movie Night for Hunger. We will explain what that is and how you can participate and make a big difference in people's lives. We'll be right back. If you would like free advice from Mr. Credit, just call or text 619-786-7853. That's 619-786-7853. Welcome back to the Lunch Hour with Mr. Credit. And today, it's Turnaround Tuesday on ESPN Radio 1700. Welcome back. It is your lunch hour. My name is Dan Osgood, sitting in for Mr. Credit. We have a very special guest. We've had him on the air. He called in one time a few months back, um, and today we we had the opportunity to get him in studio, so we jumped at it. Uh, Nate Robinson, who's a local real estate agent, also an author to The Warren Buffett Approach to Sell Real Estate, which great, great book. Um, The reason he's here today, we, we are always looking for great causes to stand behind and he has an an outstanding one outdoor movie night for hunger so nate what is it what is that let us know (laughs) it's a what how do we describe it i I think the best way to describe outdoor movie night for hunger it's it's a movement okay it's a movement it started by small like a little snowball and you start pushing it and rolling it down the hill and all of a sudden, it's grown into this great, awesome, phenomenal thing. So, still trying to understand it. But Outdoor Movie Night for Hunger is an event that we got planned um, after visiting the San Diego Food Bank after a Christmas party. Um, happened to drop off our food. We had a, a good old 58 pounds of food that we were going to bring to the food bank that we are so proud of. 
And uh, when we got there, ended up talking to a young lady by the name of Robin Scale. And she really helped us to see what the need was in San Diego. And I had no idea that this was happening in this beautiful city. You know, no idea that they were serving 350,000 people every single month. No idea that, the, you know, they were serving, you know, almost 28,000 military folks. So when I started digging into this company and finding out what they were about, it's like, you know, we told Robin we were coming back and we were going to do something great for them. And I'll, I'll bet she's uh, shocked yeah. at the greatness that this is becoming. And that is the San Diego Food Bank that this runs through? Yeah, well, the, the Outdoor Movie Night for Hunger is a movement. The, the thing that we're supporting is the San Diego Food Bank. Okay, so they're just the beneficiary of they all your the efforts. They're the beneficiary of what we're doing. Okay. Um, so we've gotten together with some really cool people. Uh, Greg Douglas, actually, with the, formerly with the Steve Miller Band. Okay. Uh, he decided that he was going to donate his talents. We told him that, hey, we're going to gather about 5,000 folks out to Qualcomm Stadium. We want to put on a great event. We want it to be an epic night of entertainment. And so we wanted families to come out and enjoy this, and we didn't want to charge them for it. Okay. You know, the reason we want to charge them is because we want them to have the heart of learning how to give. And we were going to give something to them so that in turn they can turn around and go back and serve the community. So this is open to anyone that is interested in going? It's open to anyone and everyone that's interested in actually okay. owning, showing up. Okay, and so why, why do you use a bank with the money then? Oh, <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. Well, we use a bank, uh, that it makes sense. We take our personal money and we actually drop it into banks so we can use it later on down the road. Mm -hmm. And so that's exactly what the food bank is. We're making an investment and we're putting it away into a storage facility. You know, like in the old days, in the Bible, they used to talk about we're going to have famine come up. And, mm -hmm. you know, you, you had to be prepared. You had to have storehouses so that you can go back and get food when you needed it. And that's exactly what we're doing here at the food bank is we're making some huge deposits so that this food is available not only to people that are actually going through those tough times, but, you know, people that actually are working right now who in San Diego, because of, you know, where our economy is and where housing mm -hmm. is, you know, so there's a number of people that are living below the poverty line. Okay. And so, you know, we want to help them to be able to make some withdrawals from this bank. Okay. And that's free to those end recipients. So yes, absolutely. That is outstanding. Um, how, how can people get involved? What's the best way? Uh, the best way to get involved is they can actually go to our website. It's called uh, OutdoorMovieNightForHunger.com, www.OutdoorMovieNightForHunger.com. And they can just join right there on that website, sign up, get tickets, or they can shoot me an email if they decide that they want to volunteer because we got some really cool things happening at this event. Flash mobs and you know nice. all different types of really cool things. So is this gonna be streaming live anywhere? <laughs> well, we'll see. We're actually recording it, and hopefully, you know, we can get some yeah. news stations out there. Maybe, maybe we, we can might... get Mr. Credit TV to get out there and do a little fo video footage for you. I think it'd be awesome. <laughs> I think it'd be awesome. Nate, what's the movie? Oh man, that's really awesome. Uh, we're gonna have Despicable Me too. Excellent. Uh, so it's totally family oriented. Um, you know, I think that movie has become really popular as of recent. You know, I think the song Pharrell had from it, uh, Happy, everyone's walking around clapping and singing and, and enjoying it. But the movie is uh, Despicable Me Too. And this is at Qualcomm? At Qualcomm Stadium. You know, one thing I wanted to share with you guys that uh, was really important, like why the food bank? Mm -hmm. You know, and why did we choose them? You know, one of the most important things about the food bank that I didn't get the first time I talked to them is the way they operate their business. Six percent of every dollar that they get donated to them goes toward administrative cost overhead and operations. The other 94% goes towards food. And that's tremendous. That's Most organizations are, I, I wouldn't say the exact opposite, but much closer to an exact opposite than that. Yeah, yeah. Usually it's, it's less, it was well, well below that 50% mark. So, Correct. you know, for an organization to op actually operate that efficiently, you know, it helps me to believe, you know, I'm always worried about where I'm going to stick my dollar. Right. You know, and I never want to waste it and I never want to give it away without, you know, getting a good return for it. And I know that when you make an investment with the food bank, they're being very efficient with the money. Right. Getting the end result that you're trying to accomplish by helping them out. Feed people. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and sponsorship opportunities. If, if there's, is it a business or an individual or anyone? Yeah. Can potentially be a sponsor as well. Yeah, absolutely. We uh, we take businesses. Uh, that they really help us out a lot because the cost of doing an event like this is not, it's not cheap. Right. It's expensive. 
it's, it's a stadium. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, so, San Diego didn't donate that? <laughs> no. I wish they would have. Maybe the Spanos. I don't know who controls Qualcomm at this point. But. Are they on the air? <laughs> 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 um, yeah, it, but, but we're taking businesses. We still have some opportunities for sponsors to actually jump on board, you know, get out there, get their business exposed to the community. Um, I heard, uh, I read an article in Business Week that talked about 87% of consumers would actually switch brands if they were, if that brand was affiliated with a great cause. Okay. So this, giving this, back. Yeah. So this is a great cause. And Absolutely. then if someone can't make it or if their business isn't prepared to sponsor, they can always make a donation to our GoFundMe page. Okay. And you have a, you just go to GoFundMe.com. Mm-hmm. So that's an additional way you can get involved. If you can't make it out and you wanted to help support this, you go to GoFundMe and just search for Outdoor Movie Night for Hunger? Correct. And you'll okay. find us. You'll have Nathan Robinson. We had a little video up there with the... Uh, San Diego Food Bank, so it helps explain exactly why we're doing what we're doing. And is it inside the stadium or out in the parking lot? This is in the stadium. Wow. This this is in the stadium. This This is a big deal. The movie's on the Jumbotron, so you actually got... You got two ways that you can look at it, but the movie's on the Jumbotron, and uh, Greg Douglas is going to be right there. The I think we got a bounce house for the kids to play in, lots of activities, picture taking. We, so. we went to something in a much smaller scale at a park near our house, and they just said it's some inflatable screen and their projector TV, and it was the movie Frozen. And every kid in the park was running wild. Just It was the greatest experience of their life, so mm-hmm. I can't even imagine this is such a grander scale. It'll be even a bigger more enjoyable experience for the whole family. Yeah, we're looking forward to having a great time. We, we, we gotta be, we have to respect the field because uh, the Chargers are actually playing Thursday night and then they're gonna be using the field yeah. you know, the next week or two. And one, one thing we've left out, when is this event? This event is Saturday, this Saturday. This Saturday. This Saturday, August 9th, five o'clock. We really wanna encourage everyone to come out. As, well, first of all, they gotta register on our website. So go to OutdoorMovieNightForHunger.com Click join the, you know, register, and this way you can download your tickets. They'll be through Eventbrite, okay. and they can so, come out and enjoy this event. So it's, if anyone doesn't have plans, even if you have plans, cancel them, change them. You can get down Qualcomm Stadium, free movie, and you are supporting a great, great cause, helping feed military, unemployed, homeless, underemployed, you name it. You're making a big difference in a lot of people's lives. Nate, thank you very much. Again, that is OutdoorMovieNightForHunger.com or GoFundMe and search for OutdoorMovieNightForHunger.com to support this cause. Uh, We will also put this up, put a link on the Mr. Credit page so that you can access this. Um, and, And that, unfortunately, about does it. We would love to chat a little bit more, but we are out of time today, Nate. Jim, thanks again for joining us. Pleasure being here. Corey, great having you here. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. And uh, we hope that we we accomplish our goal and have made you smarter than everyone else. Enjoy the rest of your day. It's Mr. Credit Lunch Hour. If you would like to contact Mr. Credit or access any free offers mentioned on the show, just go to mrcredit.org. That's mrcredit.org.